Hello everyone, it's DJ and welcome to another episode of RC Retirement. Today I've got an interesting interview, one I've wanted to do for quite a long time. But before I do that, since we have entered a new phase of my own career, one in which this radio program, podcast, YouTube channel, and the like is my career now, my profession, and I have promised to give personal thanks to anyone who has offered to support me in that endeavor, I am going to now reach out and thank by name the people who have chosen to do so today. Last night I opened up the Patreon campaign for people to come out and offer to support my efforts. And today, two people have chosen to do so. So I am going to do as I promised and thank those people. So just going with first names, David in, well, I won't say where they are, uh, David and Nam, thank you for your support. Thank you so much. And hopefully there will be many others to follow you and support this effort as we move forward. But that's a wonderful first step. All things start small and build from there. So again, thank you so much for your generosity and for being the first to step forward. I greatly appreciate it. And now let's move forward with this interview. This is something that I've been trying to arrange for almost a year now. And just before I came south to my home, I was finally able to make it happen. So what I've wanted to do was present a first sergeant's perspective on retirement issues, not just his own retirement problems, but retirement issues from a unit perspective. And in this guy's case, He's also a retirement services officer on the full-time side, so he can actually look at things from both sides of the fence, which I think makes it even more interesting. So we're going to go into this interview, and you can hear what he thinks and learn from his experience and learn from mistakes he has seen over the years, and hopefully not have them happen in your own unit. For those of you out there who use these videos for training in your own units, please pay attention to this. I think you will find it of great value for that type of training, for teaching soldiers and leaders how they can overcome problems in their units and for their own careers. So without further ado, let's go into this interview with First Sergeant Noel and learn a great deal from his experience. Moving on. Oh, and just one other quick note. He and I got along quite well because we were both armor crewmen, so thumbs up there. All right, moving on. All right, today we've got First Sergeant Noel joining us for an interview. He's been kind enough to spare some time and hopefully give us some of his wisdom as well. Uh, so First Sergeant Noel, you know, thank you for joining us on the RST Retirement YouTube channel. Thanks. It's great to be here. Well, uh, as I like to do with anyone joining me for a an interview, I like to g give the audience a chance to get to know you a little bit. So, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? You know, how did you get here? You know, uh, you know, I'm sure when you were sitting in high school in homeroom picking your nose, you weren't always thinking that you'd you know, end up where you are now. Absolutely you know. not. Yeah. Uh, last thing I wanted to be is one of the uh, brainwashed minions of the, uh, the militaristic state, and uh, <laughs> yet here I am. <laughs> so, uh, 
So would you mind uh, giving us a, a brief uh, summary of your career from, from then to now? Uh, well, I've served in multiple components of our armed forces, uh, reserve and active. I have served in a variety of roles in a bunch of different uh, units. I started out my career uh, as an armor crewman back on uh, M60 series tanks. Oh, wow. And then eventually transitioned to uh, the Abrams. Um, and then, uh, then from there it was uh, on to uh, uh, being a Cav Scout, 19 Delta, Hua. And uh, from then, a twist of fate uh, brought me into ordnance, and then finally back around to uh, combat arms uh, as the first sergeant for a infantry uh, headquarters company. That is a strange journey. Now, how would you say that? Now, you also had some uh, some time in uh, forward support companies and. Like you said, uh, infantry companies. Um, how would you say going back and forth between combat arms and support units uh, have influenced each other, especially at, from the first sergeant perspective? Uh, they've been a, a, a great influence, and if anything, uh, my anything but straight career has been a, a, a blessing and has allowed me to perform my functions as a first sergeant much better. I spent most of my 30-plus uh, years in the military in combat arms, and uh, so when I found myself in the logistics world, um, it, it kind of put it together, uh, brought it all together. The uh, I had had some experience as, in operations as well, and between operations and logistics, plus being in the line in a combat arms unit, uh, that really tied it all together. So uh, the combat arms like to think they're the be-all, end-all, uh, tip of the spear, um, but uh, without the supporting arms, uh, especially in those in a forward support company, uh, that the tip of the spear is going to grow dull pretty darn quick. <laughs> They fail to realize that very often, don't they? Uh, absolutely. If you can't get stuff, you can't do stuff. All right. Uh, well, you've been the first sergeant of several types of units. Uh, would you tell us uh, what those units were and what your responsibilities, your responsibilities in each of them were? Uh, how did they differ from unit to unit? Um, and how were they similar? You know, you know. What what was each unit like for you, and you know, just what was the experience like? Sure. The the first unit I served as first sergeant for was a uh, uh, light cavalry unit, and by that I mean it was a motorized cavalry equipped with uh, Humvees, um, six vehicle platoons, uh, three identical uh, reconnaissance platoons, plus a headquarters element. We're only looking at about 78 people. Um, everybody was pretty much the same. We did the same things. Um, now, admittedly, as a reconnaissance unit, we're spread out over a large area, but it was a, a fairly uh, homogenous unit and not a lot of people to take care of. Uh, then from there onto a forward support company for an infantry uh, battalion, now, that was uh, interesting because only dealing with slightly more people, uh, but uh, it is a bit like herding cats in that I had three platoons, all of which were different. So I had a distribution platoon, I had a maintenance platoon, and I had a mess platoon, all of which go to support the uh, 800 or so uh, people in the battalion. And uh, when they're all doing their functions, they're all in different places doing different things. So it's kind of the exact opposite of the cavalry troop. All right, and then moving from there uh, to the first sergeant of an infantry headquarters company, um, 
a lot like the forward support company, only a lot more pieces. Uh, currently, I have uh, four platoons, six different sections that are responsible for keeping track of. Um, it's a lot like herding cats, um, but since we're dealing with staff and staff officers, these are cats with special diets and uh, uh, definite minds of their own. And their own little catnip toys that they play oh, with. Oh, absolutely. Lots of uh, cool toys, uh, which keeping track of can be a problem. Now, that has to be entertaining. Um, you've said uh, many times uh, in conversation that as a first sergeant, you have no defined role except make it work. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, some days, I, dare I even say this, that sometimes I get bored, uh, and sometimes, uh, and mostly, I'm overworked. You know, so I'm either looking for something to do or looking for a place to hide. Uh, ultimately, my job is to the, advise and assist the commander to accomplish uh, the goals that he has set out and to uh, make the company work. Um, you know, sometimes people think of the, the first sergeant as, uh, as the dad of the unit. Actually, I, my experience makes me think it's more like the mom of the unit. My job is to make sure that they're dressed properly, they're at the right place, the right time, doing what they're supposed to do, the homework's all done, everything's taken care of, they're fed, they're disciplined, and then at the end of the day, dad comes home and takes credit. And by dad, I mean the CO. That's an interesting analogy. That, that and it that seems to fit. <laughs> I'm gonna have I might have to copy that one. I like that. Um, now you also have a very interesting dual hat here. You have a you have two roles here. You're not only a first sergeant during uh, drill weekends, but during the week you are a retirement services officer. Uh, that's correct. That has to have an interesting influence on how you do things. Um, how would you say one role influences the other, you know, in both directions? I would say that the uh, RSO job gives me a certain perspective at when I'm doing my first sergeant job in that uh, there's a lot of planning and coordinating and things don't just happen by accident. Um, too often I see where people just leave things to the end to take care of, you know, end of their career, oh, it'll get taken care of. Uh, and then suddenly that career end is a lot closer than you expect and uh, the loose ends have not been tied up. Uh, so. The RSO job has made me much more conscious of uh, what I can do to assist my soldiers in being prepared uh, for their careers uh, as well as the end of their careers. Now, conversely, I would say that the first sergeant job uh, has kept me uh, focused on the customer service aspect of it. You know, the who is it we take care of, why do we do what we do, and as an RSO and as a first sergeant, uh, the answer to that question, or those questions, is ultimately uh, soldiers. You know, we do what we do to take care of soldiers. Excellent. That's, that's exactly what I was, you know, what I've been trying to preach myself. Um, now... Um, I'm sure you can relate to this next question also. You've conducted several you know, pre-retirement seminars during your tenure as an RSO. Uh, what would you say are the three most important pieces of retirement-related uh, benefits information or just service-related benefits information that leadership uh, in the military should have? Uh, going back to what I previously said, is it's, it's not an accident. Things don't just happen by accident. You have to think about them. You have to do them. They have to be taken care of. You cannot just push things off to the end of your career. Uh, too often I see um, 
people's retirement points are not accurate. The awards that they have earned are not accurate. Uh, there's various inconsistencies in uh, the, the numerous uh, systems of record. You know, one system says the soldier is single. Another one says they're married with children. Um, once they leave service, uh, those become a lot harder to correct. So it is best for soldiers and units to stay on top of things while someone is still in uniform rather than wait till the end of one's career to uh, identify and fix problems. Um, another thing I would say, uh, along with the things don't happen uh, by accident, uh, is that you do need to plan for the inevitable. Sooner or later, this war is going to end. And, uh, you know, quoting Robert Duvall from Apocalypse Now, but uh, in this case, sooner or later, this career is going to end. And it's going to be a big change. So you've got to have some idea of what you're going to do when it's all over, uh, what status you're going to be in economically, fiscally, and uh, use the resources and the benefits you have gained to your advantage. But to do that means you need to educate yourself as to what benefits you have earned and, and thus how to use them. And uh, the third thing I would like to say is uh, things can be easy while you're in service, uh, as in you have access to databases and stuff like that. Uh, once you leave, that will cease. So uh, I would highly encourage any and everyone to get registered for a DS logon on the eBenefits website because that will allow you to have near instantaneous access of your military records as opposed to having to request them from archives or uh, find someone who can download them from iPerms or any other data storage system. That, that's excellent advice. So that, that goes right into the next question of, of information for service members. So, so that's good info for leaders and you know, for individuals as well. So... So you've already hit on my next question as well of what's good information for the individual service member. So would you like to uh, expand on the service member? Well, I'm going to I'm going to toss uh, out a couple uh, uh, tips or hints for a way for a uh, junior NCO to look like a, a real hot shot and impress his first sergeant or her first sergeant. Um, the first is to request retirement point statements for all your troops. Learn how to read a retirement point statement, then educate your troops, review those records, and help your soldiers identify and correct any errors that they find on them. Again, this should probably be done annually, uh, but seems to somehow slip by the wayside with everything else that has to be done. But this is one way to show what a real hotshot uh, leader you are. Uh, the second thing I would say kind of relates to the first one, and that is learn how to read an LES. Um, that is your pay. Uh, you should understand what is going in and what is coming out. And, uh, again, it's an excellent opportunity for a young NCO to uh, – show what a uh, hard-charging leader they are by taking care of their soldiers. Um, first of all, by learning how to read their own LES. Second of all, by teaching uh, what they have learned to their soldiers. Also good bits of information. Um, and finally, what should family members know? What do they need to know in addition to what their service members know? Family members need to understand that a lot of things in the military are on a need-to-know basis. And your significant other may not feel that you need to know uh, a lot of things like how to read the LES, what the retirement point statements mean, what all of these educational uh, things that they get briefed on annually, uh, the benefits. But ultimately, uh, you do need to know about it. You need to understand, if not understand the career, at least understand 
some of the key documents and their implications. Uh, and then have a plan. Have a plan for when that inevitable happens and a, uh, someone gets hit by a bus or is struck by a Chinese satellite falling from the sky or whatever the case may be. Um, but sooner or later, the end comes. We all have expiration dates. But what is the plan of action uh, for when that service member passes or the family member passes? Where are those important documents? Who needs to know? What benefits are out there? So that, that sounds like a good hint for, uh, for example, uh, have a when I die folder, for example. Absolutely. Or, and, and go to those pre-retirement seminars and briefings. Because ultimately those benefits that have been earned have been earned not only for the soldier, um, but also for and by the family members of that soldier, because they also serve. All right. All right. One of my, you know, you know, I don't really like the term pet peeve, but you know, I'll use it anyway. One of my pet peeves is there's a huge knowledge gap between what RSOs have in, in our heads and the average service member. Uh, what do you think can be done to improve uh, what to improve what retirement training is out there and other service benefit information uh, amongst the reserve components and to make that an even more difficult question how can this be done in a way that doesn't take service m members away from their commanders even more than already is being done in the limited amount of training time that we have every year uh, are you asking what tips I would have for service members or for other RSOs? Take your pick. Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a lot of, okay, uh, for service members, a lot of which uh, I have already hit on um, some of the big things here, yeah. but uh, it's, your, it's your, your career. You need to be active in it. You need to be an active participant. You can't just let things happen. Uh, and, and hope it all works out. You need to understand where you are in your career, what you have earned, what you still need to earn, what you still need to do to get to the goals that uh, you ultimately hope to achieve. Um, now, as far as RSOs, uh, you need to learn um, what does the customer need. And by customer, I mean, who do you serve? Ultimately, as an RSO, uh, we serve the, the soldiers, retired soldiers, and their families. Uh, so what, what systems exist to help you do your job, whether it is uh, access to uh, DRAS or DRAS, whatever you want to call it, um, or points of contact at uh, Human Resource Command, or uh, how to request uh, leave and earning statements for someone who is missing six years of their career, um, how to fix the mistakes other people make, and uh, um, how to work together and, and leverage resource, resources. Mm -hmm. All right. But what I was also asking was how can uh, training for the soldier at the unit level regarding service benefits and retirement be improved uh, well, without taking the soldier away from unit level commanders even more. Okay, in the, the years that I've been in RSO, one thing that we have learned, and add this on to the three decades of, of prior service as well, is that you can't teach everybody everything in one day. Um, in fact, even if you could do it, they wouldn't learn it. Uh, so you need to figure out who needs what information and when during their career and then determine a way to give them that. If you talk to someone who's in their first term about retirement, they're not even going to listen to you because that is an infinite amount of time away and does not apply to them. On the other hand, if you talk to someone who's got... Uh, 10 years or more service and now you're talking about blended retirement or something, um, that's probably not 
the audience for that either. Uh, so know your audience, uh, know what you are trying to present and when it is most uh, appropriate in someone's career um, and, and how it most applies to them. Don't waste their time. Right piece at the right time. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, let's, let's go with uh, a, a different tack. Uh, we spend a lot of time griping in the military, so let's close with a positive note, if we can. Uh, what, if anything, is actually being done right with uh, retirement and benefits training and, and policies, practices, whatever uh, aspect you would like to talk about? What are we doing right out there? Um, I see a lot of things being done right, um, not just in uh, my state with its uh, 8,000 uh, Army uh, Guard soldiers, uh, but in other states. Uh, I mean, things as simple as Retiree Appreciation Day events, where we're getting back out, connecting with those who have already left service, providing them uh, the, the, the services, the products, um, contacts that uh, they have earned, um, as well as finding out ways that we can learn from our mistakes and do better in the future. Um, retirement is, is a process. It is not an event, uh, and it needs to be thought of that way. I've seen some states where they're being very proactive with this, uh, whether it is having uh, special events for those who are going through the medical retirement process or whether it is having um, pre-retirement seminars for soldiers and their spouses so they can plan for retirement in the future uh, to uh, ensuring that no one rushes through their final days of service uh, and ends up um, with a, a messed up uh, record uh, but instead leaves with all the knots tied and everything uh, successfully prepared uh, for their retired pay eligibility date. Uh, so that I, I see a lot of positive things going on. Plus, there is a network of people out there that uh, we can share information with. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, that's all the prepared questions I have. Uh, do you have any other comments or or statements that you'd like to make? Uh, no, I think I've hit pretty much on all the my my big topics. Other than uh, you know, you got to think about it and you got to be involved in your own career. All right. Well, First Sergeant Noel, thank you so much for being part of the RC Retirement YouTube channel today. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. Have a great day. Hoorah. All right, so wasn't that a wonderful interview? That was stupendous, I thought, and just chock full of information. And how else can you say it? The man had some great insights. Sometimes it was simply put. Sometimes he reverted to tanker speak and said it in some gruff ways, but that's that's what you can expect. And overall, I thought he had some great words of wisdom for everybody from both sides of the fence, as I said earlier. So hopefully that was something that was useful for everyone involved, and you can learn from it, share it with others, and make others or, let's see, better able to perform and, how do I want to say this? Better able to tailor their own careers and hopefully not have the same problems that he himself has witnessed in his career. All right, so that is essentially it for this week. If you would like to benefit more from these sorts of videos, then of course come over here 
and click the subscribe button if you have not already. My goal is to get to 1,000 subscribers by the end of this year, and you can help make that happen. So please do so. If you think others can benefit from this video or others like it, then of course click that share button. Obviously, I'm also interested in whatever comments or questions you might have. If you do not have that capability because you're listening to the podcast version of this, then send me an email at dj at rcretirement.com. I'm always interested in what you have to say. If you are on YouTube, of course, use the comment section. Let me know what you think. And of course, if you would like to support the efforts of this channel, then please go to patreon.com slash rcretirement and pledge to support this channel with a monthly contribution of whatever amount you wish. There are different tiers that I've developed with different benefits of you know, three, five, 10, 15, 20 dollars per month. And if you don't like any of those, you can choose a customized amount. It could be one dollar. Whatever you wish to contribute, I would be most grateful for it. I'm not going to force you to contribute any amount that is painful to you. So it's your generosity, your money. So if you wish to contribute to support this channel, I am most grateful. But what I am most grateful for overall is the fact that you are here as part of this audience, giving me your time and attention and willing to learn from what I have learned over the years and willing to put it to use in order to better yourselves and the other service members and family members that you know. And I hope that you continue to do that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this audience. And above all, thank you for your service. Have a great night and see you next week. If you liked what you heard on today's episode, then please go below and give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to this channel. Also, please let other people know about this channel and the information it can provide for them. If you have questions or comments, then please have no qualms about posting them in the comments section below. Please remember the RC Retirement YouTube channel and the RC Retirement website are not recognized or endorsed by the Department of Defense, the Department of Veterans Affairs, or any other government agency. The information presented in these resources are for entertainment and informational purposes only. Also, the content of these resources should not be considered financial or legal advice. Please consult with your own legal counsel, accountant, or financial planner before making any decisions based on what you have learned here. As always, thank you for watching the RC Retirement YouTube channel.